received to speak in this lecture hour, brothers and sisters, I'd like to invite you to turn to a text with which this conference began on Tuesday night. Philippians, the third chapter. As far as I know, it is. Uh, I'm seeing green. Philippians chapter 3, brothers and sisters. Uh, and this passage has been referred to, and, and there's no question, I think, as to why, because our theme for the Embracing the Truth conference this year has been apprehended by grace. Yes. Yes. And in the light of that theme, apprehended by grace, I know the words of Paul that were inspired in the Spirit of God in Philippians 3 have come to mind for many brothers. And I'd like to read them again in your hearing. As the Apostle speaks of his desire to know Christ in these verses, as he speaks of his desire to attain unto the resurrection of the dead in verse 11, in Philippians 3.12 he writes, Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Apprehended by Christ Jesus. Now these words really give to us a, an understanding of apprehended by grace. Because we can think about the life of the Apostle Paul. And, and even as has been mentioned this week from Acts 9. When the Apostle Paul was headed for Damascus. He was not going to a crusade. He was not seeking the Lord Jesus Christ. He was not praying and fasting that, that somehow the Lord Jesus would reveal Himself to him. Instead, the design of Paul in going to Damascus was that he might stamp out the name of Jesus. He considered our Lord to be a false messiah. He considered Jesus to be an imposter. He considered Him to be a blasphemer. And for Paul... The, the pinnacle of that blasphemy was that he had died the cursed death of the cross. So, if you and I were to meet Paul, brothers and sisters, on his way to Damascus and ask him, what's that in your hand, Paul? Papers. What for, Paul? So that I can, I can stamp out those cursed followers of that blasphemous imposter, Jesus of Nazareth, in Damascus. I've gotten as many as I can back in Jerusalem. But oh, I I'm not content just to stamp out that name in Jerusalem. I want to stamp out that name everywhere I go. Uh, yes, sir. Three days later, you catch up with Paul in Damascus. And in the synagogues, he's preaching that Jesus is the Son of God. You ask him, Saul, what happened to you? He said, oh, let me explain. I was on my way to Damascus. And as I was on my way to Damascus, there was a voice and there was a glory that I saw. There was a glory that appeared above the brightness of the sun. And as that glory appeared to me, I heard a voice speaking out of the glory. And the voice was asking, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And all of a sudden, something happened. My world came apart. My, my, my world caved in because I realized I was seeing nothing less than the Shekinah glory of the God of Israel that the prophets had seen. I was seeing the same glory above the brightness of the sun that the prophet Isaiah, the prophet Ezekiel, all of the prophets that saw the glory of God. I was seeing the same glory that they had seen. I knew it was the glory of the God of Israel. But strangely, the voice out of the glory was saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I had to ask, who art thou, Lord? And out of the glory of Jehovah God, a voice spoke and said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. There was only one thing for me to say. That was, Lord, what would you have me do? Here Paul, if you will, in short compass in Philippians 3.12 gives us that. He speaks to the Philippians as he talks of his desire to attain unto the resurrection of the dead. And addressing a teaching, no doubt, that had been prevalent throughout so much of the Roman world as, as the gospel had been preached. 
There were some who said the resurrection was already past. That there was to be no future resurrection. Paul was to make clear that he was still anticipating yeah. the future bodily resurrection. Yeah. And so he says in verse 12, Not as though I had already attained. Yeah. Either were perfect. Yeah. But, he says, I follow after. That if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Yeah. The, the Greek word in, in, in the New Testament for apprehended is katalambano. Literally, taken hold of, or if you will, taken down. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. As Elder West began preaching on, uh, began the conference preaching on, on uh, Tuesday night, he, 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 gave, he gave this title to his message. Those of you who are here will remember, you're under arrest. Yeah. Yeah. And brothers and sisters, when we think about being taken down, yeah. you know, that's, a, that's a legal term, that's a law enforcement term. But if you will, that's exactly what happened to Paul yeah. on the road yeah. to Damascus. Yeah. Yeah. The high sheriff of heaven, yeah. the Holy Ghost, yeah. served papers on Paul. Yeah. Yeah. And I tell you, Paul makes it clear later in 1 Timothy chapter 1 that Christ Jesus appeared to him. Let's just turn there, please. Yeah. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, brothers and sisters. <laughs> And as we look at these words, if you would, please notice the Apostle Paul's words. Let's just go back to verse 12. But it's verse 16 that I want to lift before you. First Timothy 1 and verse 12, the Apostle Paul says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and unbelief. Right. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying yeah. and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom yeah. I am chief. How be it? For this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering yeah. for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. In other words, yeah. Paul's conversion is in some measure a pattern conversion. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. it may not be in the way that he saw light that was the glory of God. You and I may not have seen that outwardly. No. Yeah. We may not have seen that visibly. But brothers and sisters, the apostles' conversion was a pattern. And the way God saved Paul right. is the way that God has saved us. Yes, he yes. took hold of the apostle Paul yes. when Paul wasn't looking for him. Yes. He sought Paul when Paul wasn't seeking him. Yes. He came after Paul when Paul wasn't going after him. Yes. And I tell you, brothers and sisters, that's, that's the same way that's he dealt with of the apprehension. Yeah. Apprehended by grace. Yeah. Apprehended by Christ Jesus. Yeah. I'm so glad this evening yeah. Yeah. for the sovereign saving power yeah. of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. I'm so glad for the power of the grace of God to the sinner yeah. out of his state, out of his, out of his deadness, yeah. out of his out of his yeah. wickedness, yeah. out of his sin, yeah. out of his depravity. Sovereign grace yeah. that can pull us out and set us on the rock. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, what I want us to do tonight yeah. is to think about this matter of being apprehended by grace. Yeah. If we ask some who name the name of Christ, yeah. why are you in Christ tonight? Why are you, why are you a believer? Yeah. There would be those who would say, well, I made a decision. There would be those who said, I came to Christ. I, I will to trust Him. Oh, Lord. And then I, I have to say now, that let's just hold on a minute, because I want to be fair. I did make a decision. But I've got to understand what was behind 
that decision. I did come to Christ. I did willingly believe on Him. But I've got to understand how I came to willingly believe on Him. If I don't see that, I'm going to wind up not giving all the glory to Him that belongs to Him. Now I live him. Brothers and sisters, if I may, oh, by the way, in addition to apprehended by grace, uh -huh. I give this title to my lecture tonight, Fetched. We want to answer that question why, though. We sung this morning a great hymn of Isaac Watts, Come We That Love the Lord. We're marching to Zion. Mr. Watts wrote many great hymns that he gave to the Christian church. When I surveyed the wondrous cross, alas, and did my Savior bleed. Come We That Love the Lord. Numerous other ones. One of those that we've sung with Brother Watts in certain settings where I've been is one that I dearly love. Allow me to share the words of it with you. One of Isaac Watts' hymns about the, the feast. Mm -hmm. He says, How sweet and awesome is the place with Christ within the doors while the everlasting love displays the choicest of her stores. Mm -hmm. While all our hearts and all our songs join to admire the feast, each of us asks, with thankful voice, Lord, why was I a guest? Why was I made to hear thy voice and enter while there's room when thousands make a wretched choice and rather starve than come? And then Mr. Watts answers, Twas the same love that spread the feast that sweetly forced me in, else I had still refused to take and perish. In my sin. Right. And I want you to know, that's my answer tonight. Right. And not only that, that's the Bible answer. Yeah. To see grace in its fullness is to recognize right. that grace yeah. made me willing. Yeah. Grace yeah. gave me a taste. Yeah. Grace gave me an appetite. Yeah. Grace yeah. made me alive to have an appetite. Yeah. Grace did yeah. for me yeah. what I could not do. Yeah. Grace, I tell you. Yeah. Grace. So, brothers and sisters, we want to seek God willing to, to answer this question. And as we do, I, I just want to kind of set the stage for the lecture. And I, I might have to borrow Brother McCar out of McCarty's rule about introduction, not counting against time. You know? but, but I want you to go back to 2 Samuel chapter 9 with me, please. 2 Samuel, the ninth chapter. If you would, I'll read verses 1 through 10 in your hearing, and then verse 13. Here we have in 2 Samuel chapter 9 a, a great gospel picture of salvation. We mentioned last night in Joshua 2 the, the word kindness or chesed in Hebrew. That word is found here as well in 2 Samuel chapter 9. There in reading, beginning at verse 1. When you found it, say amen. 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 Right. 2 Samuel 9 is verse 1. And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, in Lodibar. Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Mechir, uh, the son of Amiel from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. Yeah. And David said unto him, Fear not. 
For I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore unto thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant, that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and to all his house, Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always yeah. at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. If you would drop down to verse 13, the summary. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was laying right. on both his feet. Yeah. 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 Many of you are aware that in this second, this ninth chapter of 2 Samuel, we have a glorious gospel picture illustration. We have a man, brothers and sisters, named Mephibosheth. He belongs to the wrong house. He belongs to the former fallen house of Saul, the former king. He's a man who is who, who really, by all rights before David, should have been exterminated. He should have been put to death. Saul, after all, while he lived, was constantly seeking the life of David that he might destroy David. And now David, in contrast to the common policy of kings when they took over, and they would destroy the, the, the descendants of the former dynasty, in contrast to that, David asked the question, yeah. is there any left yeah. of the house of Saul yeah. that I may show the kindness of God to him? I love those words there, brothers and sisters of verse 3. For what David in effect is saying, I want to demonstrate yeah. what God has demonstrated to me. Yeah. The very kindness that God has displayed to me. Yeah. I want to display to yeah. those of Saul's house. Yeah. Ziba's called, and so Ziba answers, well, there's one. He's laying on both feet, though. So what does David do? Verse 5 tells us, then King David sent and fetched him yes. out of the house of Mekah. Yeah. Yeah. He fetched him. Yeah. He brought him. He took him. Right. Yeah. But I like that word, fetched. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. It has a picture there, you know. Yeah. I realize some of y'all will read from other than the King James. I know there's forgiveness for that, amen. <laughs> <laughs> that was pun from the pen in chief. But, but I love the rendering here. It's just simply the Hebrew word lakot to take. But oh, fetched. Yeah. For you see, when you're laying on the feet and the king calls for you, yeah. there's only one way. Oh, you can get to oh, it. Ah! 
trespass in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. Now that says it right there. Where was I? I was dead. I was dead. I was like that dog Rover. You remember him? I was dead all over. some life there. But, but don't do that. Because you can't get life in where God calls you dead. Now, now the life's coming, hallelujah. Help's on the way. God, the, the, the deadness of our soul, the deadness of our spirit toward God cannot be in any way altered by saying, well, man had a little spark in him. Oh, no. no. Those far. There's nothing there for, 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 the, for the Lord to blow on. I, this is not in God. This is, this is not regarding this morning's message. Brothers and sisters, there's nothing there in the way of possible yeah. to pay attention. That's right. 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 You're dead. That's right. And as we turn to Romans 3 and survey just a little bit there, brothers and sisters, the condition of our humanity as enemies of God, I want you to notice how that deadness is displayed in Romans chapter 3. And I know these words are familiar to so many of you as well, but, but again, I, I want us in this lecture hour to, to think about our human condition mm -hmm. as we consider that calling of grace. That apprehension by grace, that fetching of grace. Yeah. Romans chapter 3, brothers and sisters, and if we could, let's notice together. Beginning at verse 9, Paul's summary about Jew and Gentile alike. In Romans 3 9, we read, What then? Are we, that is, Jews, better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all yes. under sin. Yes. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Someone has called those words the four Protestant nuns. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. 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 But you notice it. None. 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 And among those nuns is this reality. There is none that seeketh after God. Yeah. Now that, if you will, is, a, is an outward word picture of what we've seen in the Phibosheth. Yeah. He was laying in both his feet. Yeah. And you and I when it comes to our spiritual state, deadness, lameness, we're not seeking God. Oh, I, I know we like to think, well, I grew up in church and I've always been a good boy. My Lord, my Lord. That's a lie to its teeth in there. It is if this boy is telling it, I'll tell you that. But we would like to credit ourselves with goodness. We like to credit ourselves as seeking God. But brothers and sisters, the reality is Scripture nails it down. There's none that seeketh after God. Yeah. That's as plain as it can get. And I want you to notice the conclusion in Romans 3 and the words there of verse 18. There is no fear of God before their eyes. We don't seek Him because we don't fear Him. We don't seek Him because... In our heart of hearts, there is really no reverence, no regard, no respect for Him. That's a reality. And so the Apostle goes on to say, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. Why? That every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. When the gavel falls on humanity, Jew or Gentile, it doesn't matter. When the gavel hits the courtroom desk, this is the verdict. Every mouth silent. Shut your mouth. 
You're guilty. Yeah. You've not sought God. Yeah. You've not done good. Yeah. You've not feared Him. Every one of us has a guilty verdict against us hanging in the back. That's right. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. The only thing we can hope for is a temporary stay of execution. All right. 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 All but if you would please turn over in Romans 5 and, and notice again as we think of our, the condition of humanity as enemies of God. Please notice some select verses from Romans 5 here. Verses 6 and following referred to this morning by Elder Spots in his message from Matthew's Gospel. What a blessed word. Amen. 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 Romans chapter 5 and verse 6. Notice please. For when we were yet what? Without, Without strength. strength. In due time, Christ died for the For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet, Christ died for us. Verse 10, please. For if when we were, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. We were without strength. We were ungodly. We were sinners. We were enemies. Think about that. We had lifted our hand in defiance of the living God. We had said by our actions, if not by our words outwardly, but by our actions, by our heart, by really our words otherwise, we have said, I'm a declared enemy of the living God. I do not fear Him. I will not seek Him. And in effect, brothers and sisters, if by our sin we could have our way, we would have crept into heaven to the very throne of God and put our hands around His throat had it been possible and choked the utter life out of us. We have taken our knives, we have taken whatever weapon we had, and we would have put God to death had it been in our power. You're right, you're right. If you don't believe it, look at what happened when God came down here. That's right. What is the cross? The cross is a demonstration of humanity's hatred of God. So when God came down, Emmanuel, we said we'll not have this bad reign over us. We were enemies then, brothers and sisters. And then if you would turn over finally to Romans chapter 8. And notice the words there in verses 7 and 8. There we read these words, Romans chapter 8 and verse 7. Because the carnal mind, that is the mind of the flesh, the mindset of the flesh, is enmity or hostility against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You see, by nature, that's where we are. In our, in our, in our lives, in our souls, in our spirits, we, 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 we've got a mind that's set on the flesh. And, and it's in hostility with God. We don't want, we don't want peace. We don't want to end the warfare by nature. We, we, we're not subject to God's law. We can't be, in fact. And, and, and we're in the flesh and unable to please Him. That's where we are in our depravity. That's where we are in the nature of the flesh that is ours, born into this world in union with Adam. Yes, sir. Brothers and sisters, if this was all I had to tell you this evening, I would not have begun the lecture. Yes, sir. Oh, hey! Out of that mass of damnation that is humanity, out of that mass of condemnation, God purposed to save out of every kindred, tribe, yeah, tribe, yeah. tongue, yeah, and people. Yes, he purposed to save yes, a multitude yeah. that no man can know. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Lord. It began with God back in his heart. Yeah. The time began yeah. when he set his love upon a people who were altogether unlovable. Yeah. Yes, and in electing grace, He chose them in Jesus Christ. Yes. He pitched His love upon them to use the words of the old Puritan. I like that. He, I, he didn't just 
kind of brandedly and throw it, no? Yeah, no. Yeah. Look to David Morris. God Almighty. He yeah. pitched his love. Yeah. Yeah. You know yeah. what? Yeah. He's yeah. a mighty good pitcher. Yeah. He hit his target. Yeah. 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 That's the mighty God. Yeah. 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 We see God's electing love in Scripture. And we, we, won't, we won't enlarge on that at this time, but, but really that's part of being apprehended by grace. The depraved sinners. God set His love on us. Yes. Though we were enemies, though we would not seek Him, right. though we would not have Him, He said, I will seek you and I will have you. Yeah. That's mercy, I'll tell you. Yeah. That's grace. And I want us now, brothers and sisters, with that little bit of background, to think together about the calling of His elect. You quoted with me together, so many of you, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. You remember, though, that it doesn't end there either, does it? For immediately after verse 3, we were by nature the children of wrath. But God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love, wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead, for by grace are you saved. And he hath raised us up together. And made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What did what, what, what happened there? Oh, hallelujah, brother and sister. I tell you this evening. Thank God tonight that in the midst of our fallen, desperate condition, there's a body in Scripture. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm so glad to read the Bible. Hallelujah. And as I read God's Word, I'm going through it. And hallelujah, every now and again, one of those bots will fly through there. Yeah. 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 Think about it. Yeah. Oh, this those who are not going to make it into the kingdom. First Corinthians 6, 9 and following. Yeah. Unrighteous shall not inherit. He mentioned fornicators. He mentioned adulterers. He mentioned drunkards. He mentioned slanderers. And he says, and such were some of you. But ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Thank God for a but in Scripture. I'm glad this evening that following the cemetery, if you will, following my deadness, there's a but. It doesn't have anything to do with me, really. Because when you're dead, there's just a, not a whole lot you can do to get yourself out of that condition. If the one who is the resurrection and the life of the hallelujah, like Lazarus, four days dead, there's a way, I tell you, that the sinner can't be raised out of his deadness, out of that lifelessness. Hallelujah. And brother and sister, that's what's happened. Yeah. God, I tell you, has shown up. Yeah. God is speaking a life-given word, and because of that, sinners who were dead are brought out of their deadness. Yeah. Well, you see, that great picture of John 11 with the resurrection and the life, it's really a gospel picture too. Yeah. For you see, you and I, like Lazarus, four days dead. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Some of us were like Lazarus right. too. We stunk. Yeah. Oh, yes. yes. oh, yes. yes. oh, yes. yes. oh yes. he yes. stinking. Yes. 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 Some of us, we were stinking in the stench of our deadness and sin. Yes. Yes. Oh, hallelujah. He spoke that word. David, come forth. And I that was dead yes. came forth. Yes. I was still in my grave clothes. Couldn't walk. I was wrapped tight. Yes. How did I get out? It was my yes. divine. I still have some great clothes on me. Yeah. 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 Command the Christ to loosen me and let him go. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I need my brother's help to get out of my great clothes. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I, I might miss one and the stench might be back there. You know, the yeah. funk. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And I need my brother's just help. Brother, I noticed a great clothes back right there. You, well, let's get that off. Thank you, brother. Yeah. 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 The life giving had to come from the life giver. Yeah. 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 God had to do that, I tell you. Yeah. And that's what happened. That's good. He 
quickened us. He right. made us alive. Yes, sir. Right. And that, brothers and sisters, is, is, if you will, the sum of being apprehended by grace. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, brothers and sisters, I want us to, to turn to some scripture that would point out this. As we, we think about this calling of God's elect, mm -hmm. would you turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1? And notice the Apostle Paul's words there. 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. And if I may, let me begin reading there. At verse 21, but as one of the brethren observed, if you say no, I'm still going to do it. It's just curse. Verse 21 of 1 Corinthians 1. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them to believe. The preaching here is a reference to the message proclaimed, which is Christ crucified. And as the apostle goes on, he says this in verse 22. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Notice what Paul is saying. He said we're preaching a message. To the world it's a foolish message. It's a message they don't want to hear. To the Jews it's a stumbling block. To the Greeks it's foolishness. To the Jews, as no doubt it was for Paul when he was Saul of Tarsus, the rabbi. He heard about this Messiah crucified, nailed to a tree. He remembered that Deuteronomy had said that cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So he did not see how it was that Messiah, if he were really Messiah, could die on a Roman cross. So for the Jews, that was a stumbling block. The Greeks, on the other hand, they wanted wisdom. So the cross... To them was foolishness. Yeah. They heard that message and they said, Oh, yeah. that God would become a man by a virgin womb and live 33 years and then die on a cross and then rise again. That's foolishness. That's but notice what Paul says in verse 24. Yeah. Doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Greek. Yeah. He says, But unto them which are called, yes, both Jews and Greeks, yes, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because he had become a curse for us. Yeah. We were under the curse. Yeah. And the only way we could be free from the curse yeah. is if he became yeah. the cursed one yeah. in our place. Yeah. And so in Galatians 3 wrote, yeah. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Yeah. Now, yeah. being made a curse yeah. for us. Yeah. Yeah. There's that wonderful exchange that the reformers yeah. preached. Yeah. It was the heart of the Reformation. Yeah. The wonderful exchange, Christ in our place. Christ taken our curse upon himself. Yeah. And in taking our curse, yeah. brothers and sisters, hallelujah, we receive his righteousness. Yeah. Yeah. And for those, it doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Greek, and you found the gospel objectionable. When you are called, yeah. all of a sudden that gospel yeah. becomes sweet. Yeah. Now, I have to point out in verse 24, as so many places in Paul's letters, the word called here is not referring to the outward call of the gospel. Right. Now, we must distinguish rightly in the scriptures between the outward call of the gospel and this inward or effectual call. Right. Yeah. The outward call goes forth and everybody who hears that outward call is called in that outward sense. Yeah. That's the one the Lord Jesus referred to in the gospel where he said, many are called, but few are chosen. Now the call that we see here in distinction makes the person who receives the outward call open receive and welcome that message. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And so Christ becomes the power of God and the wisdom of God. Yeah. Yeah. In other words, the outward call is driven home effectively in power 
so that the gospel yeah. now becomes yeah. sweet to me. Yeah. 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 Some of you know what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah. Some of you remember that time. Yeah. Yeah. You heard that message yeah. and you said, keep that junk to yourself. Yeah. I'm not interested. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to go to the crazy house with the rest of those religious folk. Yeah. Then, then the Holy Ghost. Oh, yes, he began that beating up work. Can you beat you up? Can you work on your heart? Let me know how to do it. He began to, he began to squeeze that heart. He began to pound on you. And all of a sudden, that gospel began sounding sweet to you. You, you had no taste for it at one time. It, 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 just, it just didn't register. It just didn't Was it work? Yeah. Yeah. The Holy Ghost. Yes, sir. Our word persuade comes from the Latin root to make very sweet. Yeah. To make very sweet. Can't the Holy Ghost do that? Yeah. Can he make the gospel sweet to you? Oh, I had no taste for it. But then grace came in. I was apprehended and I was called. And all of a sudden, the gospel became the sweetest news in heaven and earth. What did that I say? It was the call of grace. That inward, effectual, powerful, life giving call. Yes, That's when I came out of the cemetery. Hallelujah. That life giving, effectual call came. For some of you, it may not have been protracted. It may not have, it might not have been lengthy. It might have been that you were in church house one day. Come on, preacher. You heard the gospel preacher preaching the good news of God's Son. And then somehow your heart was hooked. Very good yeah. Very yeah. 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 You know who to blame it on? <laughs> Don't say, well, I, I decided to follow Jesus. Well, you may have, but. The credit belongs to the Holy Ghost. God did that, I tell you. I love the way that John Bunyan distinguished it. Mr. Bunyan, who had spent some time there in England, writer of Pilgrim's Progress and other great works, Mr. Bunyan said the, the hen in the barnyard, she, uh, she can go around all day in the barnyard. I won't cluck for you, but Talk it, you know. <laughs> She'll do it, you know. And, and those biddies won't move. They won't budge. But let danger arise. Now, now. And that hen will cluck, and those biddies will come, and they'll gather under her wings. If you will, that's a good way of thinking about that general call, that outward call. And that special inward effectual call. Yes, sir. You see? The gospel can go out in that outward call yes, and it never registers. That's right. That's right. But as that call goes out, when the Spirit of God is pleased yes, to drive it home, yes, then all of a sudden oh. you hear that special call and you go running right to Jesus yes. to hide under his wings. Yes. And I want you to know there's a refuge under the shadow. Yes. A farmer whose barn had burnt. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the insurance adjuster came out to, to handle the claim for the, for the farmer. And as they were surveying the damage, the, the barn gone there, the farmer passed over the ground and noticed there was his hen burnt to a crisp. And it just, you know, all the, all the loss of his barn and all the loss of his animals, it had angered him to the point that he just said, even got no hen, and he kicked her. And when she did, out ran her biddies. Yeah. Wow. Out ran her chicks. Yeah. Hey, 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 hey. The fire fell at Calvary.
Lord. Brothers and sisters, we see that this special call is. There are other scriptures that bear it out, but, but suffice it at this moment that we look at that. And, and brothers and sisters, let me ask you to turn back to the Gospel of Luke really quickly. Gospel according to Luke. And if you would please, notice chapter 14. Yes. That great parable of the great suffering. You know it. But let me ask you though to notice please verses 16 through 18. And then we'll drop down to verse 21 and verse 23 for the sake of time. And then Luke 14. Verse 16. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper, and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all, with one consent, began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee had me excused and so on. The thing I want you to notice here is the response to the invitation that expresses the natural state of our heart. Wow. By nature, there's one thing yeah. on our mind when we hear the gospel, and that's going to hell. Yeah. Yeah. Lord, yeah. Lord, Lord. By nature, there's one thing on our mind when we hear the gospel, and that's going to hell. Yeah. Because with all, all with one consent, we've got excuses. Yeah. Let me ask you, how many of you would buy a piece of ground and then go and see it? Uh, Does that wow. make any sense at all? But that's like our excuses for not coming to Christ. Lord, Lord, Lord. I like what one brother said. He said an excuse is the skin of a reason stuck with a lie. <laughs> And that's what an excuse is. They all with one consent began to make excuse. <coughs> Drop down with me please. To verse 21. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house being angry said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. Think about that a moment. Four classes of people mentioned. Every one of them, if you will, would have had to have been brought. Yes. Yes. Can you, can you yes. imagine the poor man being told? The man in the big house wants you to come in for you. I, you set me up. I'm not going, I will go with you. I will be your escort and bring you. No, 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 no. The head, the maid. The hall, the how are they going to get there? If you will, they're going to have to be fetched. <laughs> if they get there, they're going to have to be fetched, I tell you. No other way they're going to get there apart from being brought. If you will, drop down yet again, brothers and sisters, in these words of Luke 14. And, and notice, please, verse 23. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Do what? Compel them to come in. The Greek word is anankazo. It has the idea to show them the urgency, to press the urgency. And oh, I tell you, the Spirit of God, He's able to do that. He's able to compel us. He's able to draw us in. He's able to, if you will, to use the words of Brother Watts, him, he's able to sweetly force us in. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, may I say to you, that's what he does by his grace. Now, time is fleeting. And I just, I just want to summarize the next chapter, Luke 15. Because there we see, if you will, again, being apprehended by grace. You remember the saying? Yeah. You remember that the Lord Jesus has... Those who draw near to Him, publicans, sinners, harlots, tax collectors, the scum, the dregs of society, they gather to hear Him gladly, hallelujah. And when that happens, the religious crowd begins to say, this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And the Lord Jesus tells a threefold parable to show that's exactly right. That's what I'm doing. 
But remember how he unfolds the parable. It's one parable, three frames. The first frame, remember it. Lost sheep. Lost sheep. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. A wayward, wandering sheep yes, sir. who has left the fold. Yes. Yes. The only hope that sheep has is that the shepherd will go out after the right. Yeah. And so it is that Christ, as he gives the first frame, to show how precious to God these lost ones that are coming to him in his ministry are. He, he illustrates by a lost sheep. One out of a hundred, by the way. Then he gives the frame of the lost coin. One out of ten in this case. And he talks about the coin. A woman had a coin that was lost. And that coin that was lost, just as the sheep points to the waywardness and wandering of, the, right. of, our, of sinners, right. so the coin points to the deadness and insensibility yes, of the sinner. Yes. That coin once lost could do nothing to recover itself. That coin once lost could not tell the woman, sweep over here, see my hand, raise my hands here. No, nothing that coin could do. It was dead, it was inanimate, it was lifeless, it was insensible, it was insensitive. Well, pictures us in our natural spiritual condition. Yes. No. May I tell you that woman? Good picture of the Holy Ghost. That woman started sweeping, yeah. stirring up some dust. Yeah. Some of y'all remember when the Holy Ghost stirred up some dirt in your life, don't you? Yeah. 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 He stirred up some dirt, and all of a sudden, you were found, hallelujah. Yeah. That coin that was lost, yeah. dead, insensitive, lifeless, had been found. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Now, a lot of people like to quote the last frame, uh -huh. the prodigal son, yeah. I will arise and go to my father, but they do so without remembering the first two frames. That's right. Yeah. You yes, can't sir. appreciate the last frame, That's the longer true. frame, yeah, yeah. granted, you can't appreciate it without the first two frames. That's right. Yeah. The wayward, wandering sheep, the dead, insensitive coin. And they're one parable, for Dr. Luke says in verse 3, and he spake this parable unto them. Not these parables. This. This parable. Because the teaching, the thrust of the parable, is one major thrust. That's right. And that is God saves sinners. What kind of sinners? Wayward sinners. Wandering sinners. Dead sinners. Insensible sinners. And he does it to the praise of the glory of his grace. Yeah. Well, brothers and sisters, there's so much more to say. But we need to make room for the preacher of the hour. I want to ask you if you would. By the way, let me just mention biblical imagery. I'll cheat. I guess this is my third close here. I'll get my tenth in the The biblical imagery. Creation. God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness and shine in our hearts. Same one who said, let there be light. And light wasn't saying, God, I'll help you out. Because light hadn't been yet. And that's the same kind of work he did in our heart when he saved us. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6 says, and those verses preceding are excellent verses as well to illustrate the truth of being apprehended by grace. But brothers and sisters, also think about the created creation that is mentioned in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, a new creation. And isn't that what Ephesians 2, 10 says? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has ordained that we should walk in this. But as I close tonight, please, let me ask you as we think of being apprehended by grace, let me ask you, to turn to Jeremiah 31, please. Yeah. Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 3. Jeremiah chapter 31 and the third verse. Verse 
verse 3. Listen to these words, brothers and sisters. The Lord hath appeared unto me of old, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Oh, tonight, brothers and sisters, listen to your God speaking to you. Listen tonight to your God, child of God. Listen to your God telling you tonight. I have loved thee. I like how it begins. Yay! Yes! Oh, have you ever said yes? What's your God saying, child of God? Yes! Yes! I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with love and kindness have I drawn you. Oh, I was in the pit. Jeremiah later would record how he was sunk down in that dungeon pit. The mire wrapped around him. And he read now that Ethiopia would bring the ropes with dirty men and some old cast clouds or clothing. She says about her beloved, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. Yeah. But she says something strange in verse 4. She says, draw me, we will run after thee. Yeah. Now what's yeah. strange to me is, any woman saying, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, uh -huh. shouldn't have to say, draw me. That's right. But oh, it pictures well where we are, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. For you see, grace has drawn me. Uh -huh. But as I live in this world, I want to know His intimacy. I want to know His kisses. Yeah. I felt Him this week, hallelujah. Uh -huh. yeah. Jesus has drawn yeah. me to my soul. Yeah. He smothered me with kisses, hallelujah. Yeah. But oh, there's something in me, even yeah. now, that if I had, if I could, I'd run again from it. Yeah. Yeah. But oh, there's something in me that says, when I say, let him kiss me, right. the kisses of his mouth, there's something he's placed in me by his spirit that makes me cry out, draw me, draw me. we'll run after you, yeah. draw me. Yeah. Oh, sometimes I just have to cry out in my condition, draw me. Draw me. Sometimes my depravity will rise up and I just need, draw me. And let me tell you tonight, he is a drawer. Yeah. He is a drawer. He is one who knows how to get me where I need to be. Yeah. One day, to the praise of the glory of His grace, yeah. I'll be thrown fully into His presence. Hallelujah. Yeah. The King is going to bring me into His chambers. Yeah. Oh, brothers and sisters, we shall be with Him. Yeah. We shall be like Him. Yeah. And it's all because we've been apprehended yeah. by grace. Yeah.